thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've been just having a wonderful time since we've come. I do want to introduce my operations manager, Tim Sullard. And when I talk about ideal situations, Tim, Tim could you stand up, please? If you. He has to remember who signs his paycheck, you know? You gotta remind them, right? Um, but he'll tell you the truth about all the mistakes that I make as well. So what we're gonna be talking, I always like to do like all the legal stuff. Since we're a business and not a nonprofit or government agency, we're real careful about um, what we use. Everything's in the public domain. And um, I have an account with Flickr, and if any of you like some of the things that we use for this particular program, you're more than happy to friend or whatever we do on Flickr to take a look at what my fave list is, which is about 1,300 really good kind of storybook photos. They tell a story, be more than happy to share them. And we also, of course, remind those of you who like to tweet that I, I love the side check. Even if you say bad things about me, it's better than nothing. Okay, so please feel free to comment as we go through. There's a key idea today. So if you're surfing programs and you're deciding whether or not you're going to stay, here's the key idea, which is not to stop learning. I'm going to tell you something, and I would like shock crowd noises. Do you know that some educators and teachers, once they get tenure or get to a point, they stop learning? Can I have shock crowd no. no, very good, very good. And a lot of us who've been doing it for a while, it's human nature. We get a little tired. We get a little smug, particularly if we're successful. And one of the problems with being successful is it sort of petrifies us. It kind of grows this little shell around us as well. So I'm really into behavioral outcomes. And the kinds of things that we want to happen here, I think of them almost more like assignments than outcomes. So this is sort of your homework. And at the end, we're going to review these very quickly again and see if anyone says, yeah, I, I think I see a couple things here I want to do. We also have created a a PDF for this and it's going to be um, downloaded so you'll have access to all this information as well. But there's a couple of things on the list that I think are important to consider for the program we're going to be doing. The number one thing is learning to break your own rules. How many people, this is sort of like you know your Oprah moment, how many people besides me have pontificated to other people about the right way to do instructional design or classroom teaching? Okay, this is the kind of thing, if you know the person next to you and they haven't raised your, their hand and you think they should, you can point at them, okay, or take their hand and raise it. I think that once we get to a certain age, we do the soapbox once in a while. So one of the things that I hope you get inspired after today is to break one of your own rules, or the rules. You know, in the soft sciences, they're soft sciences because we're not counting boulders. We're talking about human behavior. And I'm the kind of person that when I hear someone point a finger at me and say, this is the way you're supposed to do instructional design and here's the study who, that proves it, I'll, I'll call up the person who did the study. I'll look at the original research and I find it's five kids in some obscure school in Kenosha, Wisconsin, right? And the person did it for a master thesis, but they did such a good job at presenting at that national conference. Now it's kind of the law, you know? And so I'm hoping that we come out better risk takers as well. Um, for those of you who didn't read the description, this is not about technology. We're talking about human behavior today. And the last one on the list I think is real important and I'm gonna bring this one up again. For those of you who've been teaching for a while or been instructional designers and you're good at what you do, you're really good. I bet people look up to you. I bet that you're the person who models the behavior for everyone else. And we hit these plateaus of learning. Well, one of the things I learned from my mentor, who is in her field, internet, not nationally known, internationally known. She's the kind of person who's beautiful, single mother, commutes from Colorado to Singapore and Hong Kong and London. You just want to throw acid on her, you know? And, and she's nice. She's nice. And she had a plateau, so you know what she did? She went and took singing lessons because she's really, really bad at singing. So she could be the worst person in the class because she had been so successful for so long, she had forgotten what it feels to fail. And I really appreciate the studies that have been done about smart cookies who very carefully avoid anything that challenges them, consciously or unconsciously. So by the time they're 30, 40, 50, they haven't been experiencing those very healthy failures 
where they learn to grin and smile and they lose that empathy with the subject matter experts and with the students they work with as well. Um, this study, if you want to call it this program today, was inspired by our cousin Toby. And Toby, for 40 years, was working in maintenance in railroads, and he became the top guy in charge of um, the operations of a major railroad system in the southeast. And you might know, this is commonsensical, that um, the railroad industry has one of the highest level of accidents and deaths and stuff. So they have the best, best, best research on what causes accidents. So they were doing a study a few years ago, and you, I heard this all um, at Christmas um, over adult beverages, and Toby said that what they were looking at were patterns of behavior based on longevity of how long someone had worked there. And it was the classic bell curve. And I bet some of you already can anticipate what I'm going to say. The first two years out on the job, people are dangerous. Like, you don't want to be in a train with people who've only been on the job two years, trust me. Um, after three or four years, they do pretty good. And then there's a period between seven and 15 years on the job that they do excellent work. They do excellent work. The accident, the air rate goes way, way down. And then, this is what shocked everyone. Starting 15 years out, the air rate went up so that when someone had been on the job 20 to 25 years, their error and accident rate was almost identical to someone who had been on the job for two years. So this idea that the longer you do something, the better you get at it, that's not necessarily true. And I can speak for myself that it's, I've been, I have been paid to stand in front of audiences and do programs, whether it's college instructor or workplace learning for 40 years now. And my absolute dead fear is that I'm going to turn into one of those old biddies with the mimeograph machine like we had in the 50s in Chicago, right? And I don't know if anyone else here experienced that, but my older sister could actually give me the complete semester's work for our geography te uh, teacher at um, Horace Mann Grammar School in the south side of Chicago because the woman had not changed anything she had done for 30 years. Did anyone else have a teacher like that, K through 12? Okay, now here's the uh, Dr. Phil question. Does anyone think that there's someone at their school or university who's doing the same thing right now? Yeah. We know. We know. So this is nothing new. So Cousin Toby really inspired me to start doing research on the subject. But just to be clear, when I did the first version and handed it to my husband, who's a very scholarly man, he looked at it very seriously and he said, well, sweetheart, this is a list of all of your character flaws. What is this program for? So I want to be real clear that I do a good job because I make all these mistakes myself. So I'm not trying to stand up here and say that I'm immune from the same things. But first, we're going to do a little survey, because I'd love to know who's in the room. And when I do it, you can stare at the other people in the room. How's that? And turn around. So, how, And by the way, we, um, we'll just do this real quick. This is for my benefit and for your benefit to see who's in the room. And um, I realize you might raise your hand more than once. And I was raised in Chicago. Vote early, vote often. So <laughs> how many of you, how many K through 12 people do we have? Could you raise your hand? OK, very good. And higher ed. This is the higher ed track. Very good. Do we have any ind people who are also independent consultants? Maybe you do a little on the side. Oh, good, and you're raising your hand. You just got fired, of course, from your institutions, but what the heck? Do we have, um, I didn't know how you referred to yourselves, folks. I was like the Oxford Oxonian, so I came up with the Canvasonians. Are there Canvasonians in the room who work for Canvas? Very good. Let's see what we have here. So we have the, the K-12, we have higher ed folks, we have the independents, we have the Canvasonians, and we have the others. Do you put yourself in an other position? Okay, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, we call it conference amnesia. I suffer from it a couple of days in a hotel and I forget where I am, my name. I'm thank this is what these badges are for, right? About stuff. So what this does, we're also going to take a look, and this is the fun part for me, how long you've been an instructional designer. And let's do the broadest definition. So let's include webinars and teleconferences and any of those old school kinds of things we did years ago. And obviously, you'll be raising your hand more than once. So we may have some newbies who've come. How many people can say, yeah, I've been doing it for a year or less? OK, five years or less? 
great. 10 years or less, 20 years or less, more than 20 years, more than 20 years. Okay, now here's the extra credit things. How many people have actually used the Jones International University interface? They were the first online university accredited 100% online university in 1993, and it sucked. All right, and then for, <laughs> and I'll tell you how bad it was, and this is why I'm so qualified to teach the program. I was so bad at it that I had to hand back the money to the project. It was a big project for the Department of Education in Colorado and our state library, big statewide project, and I sat in my house and wept because I couldn't figure out how to do it. And the person who was my supervisor was wonderful and very strict and a good friend. So she said, this sucks, and she would send it back. So I wept and sent back all the money. Publicly humiliated myself 20 years ago in Colorado because I couldn't figure out how to use it. Now, now here's the extra, extra credit. The New Jersey Institute of Technology Electronic Information and Exchange System, Murray Turoff System, that was set up in 1976. And we were part of the experimental program in 78. And you'll love this. Instructional design in that case was university professors basically downloading their doctoral theses at a time that we had 300 DPI printers. And we would set the printer to run at night and come back in the morning, and it was still chugging away. And I said to my husband, if this is online education, I don't want any part of it. Is there anyone here who remembers it or was part of that? <gasps> very good, very good. Do you remember that with a chug, a chug, a chug? I wanted to go find these people and shoot them. It was just <laughs> terrible. So what this brings us to is the first point. And the first point is, assuming you know your audiences. Assuming you know, simply because you've taught in an institution, you think you know your students. You make assumptions, and when I say you, of course I don't mean anyone in the room. I mean those people who didn't come today, the ones you left at home. They haven't noticed that their traditional um, 18 through 22 year old students are being replaced with commuter students. They've had so much experience with people who live in dorms, they forget that a lot of their students have jobs and families and are doing their work at 3 o'clock in the morning and need really clear instructions. You know, that was something that ticked me off. Um, about 10 years ago, I started working with the University of North Texas um, online universities, a particular program called the LEAD program. And everyone was telling me all these wonderful statistics about how they did online education. And I looked and found every single study was about classroom students. There was nothing that addressed the people that I did, you know, people who were working with families. It was all about classroom. And I was, I was irritated about that because it wasn't giving me the information I want. And some places of higher ed I visit, the instructional designers and the instructors themselves have not had a real conversation with a student in years. So what do I want you to do to kind of cure this stuff? Obviously, we have surveys and we have polls and interviews, but I am not even a fan of focus groups anymore. I want people to leave their office and go out into the commons and sit down, not in the fancy faculty cafeteria, but sit down with students and chat with them and listen to what's going on and what do they care about. Maybe go in disguise so they don't know your faculty or an instructional designer and say, so what do you think of the online programs we have here, right? What do you think about how it is? And prepare to be dismayed because that's where you're gonna hear this stuff. Um, the kids, and I'll say kids here, um, are really good at telling people what they want to hear. And do you know that not all colleges and universities have adequate feedback systems so that we are able to um, safely have students communicate with faculty? Did you know that? Another shot crowd noises? I know, I know, it's sort of terrible about it. So that's one that's really important to me. The second thing is, and I have to admit, I have been brainwashed as much as anyone else. I went to one of those notorious hippie colleges in Vermont in the late 60s and early 70s. Yes, I was a country hippie. Yes, I lived in a farming commune. And it was one of those places, Goddard College, where if it wasn't experiential education and if it wasn't John Dewey, it didn't count. And so I was programmed just like you imprint a duck at 17 that that was what education was about. How many people think they were imprinted in a particular field of education, right? And you get that little 
thing in your mouth if you're at a party and someone brings up your opponent about things. So I've been very, very much brainwashed in, in behavioral, and, and, but more cognitive psychology than behavioral. I have, I've dated behaviorists, you know, that's, that's cool. Um, but when, <laughs> but you get that thing and you get that edge in your voice and pretty soon people don't seat you with them at, at dinner parties and things like that. Cause, you know, so holding to one theory only, one ring that rules them all, right? One theory that rules them all. So what I had to learn how to do was to explore, regardless of how old I was, to start looking at new systems, at new theories. And we're going to talk a little bit about looking at the literature. But one of the hardest things I had to learn how to do was to risk. And I have a friend named Laura Ewing, who's a um, psychotherapist and behaviorist who works with big companies. And she said success is very dangerous because after a while, you're really afraid of losing your core constituency, the people who trust you and like you because you do a predictably successful product as an instructional engineer because you know what to do and how to do it to satisfy most people most of the time. Right? And you sort of start doing things where the truth is not that the other theories are wrong, but you don't want to take the risk of saying, I tried something new and I failed in, in front of you know, the campus and God and everybody else and the faculty senate and such. And the truth is that maybe the reason you're successful is not just because what you're doing is competent, but people are used to you and they forgive you a lot. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? That it's like, oh yeah, that's how Fred does his classes, you know, and there's this little network of people say, oh, if you take one of Pat's classes, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, and she hasn't changed for 10 years, so you'll just have to go along with it. And you think you're doing great. So one of the things I like to remind people is that there are over 50 major conflicting theories about how people learn, and that's the website. Isn't that nice? So you can go to that website, and a wonderful man over the years has accumulated the URLs, so you can whip through and look at dozens of practical theories related to instructional design. That's my gift for you today to go through, and it's really fun. Uh, some of them are pretty similar, I have to admit. I would say maybe there's closer to 25 than you know, 50 plus. But it's a great place to say, I'm going to take some risks, and maybe I'm going to switch out. Maybe I'll find a, f a friendly faculty member or teacher and say, let's play a different game, in effect. Let's try something different, and get me a friendly audience that if I fall on my face, I'm not going to be in trouble. And that's why I like the word experiment. Could you repeat after me, it's an experiment. One, two, three. It's an very good. That gets you to get away with a whole bunch of stuff. You know, it's an experiment. And then you say, I really want a lot of critical feedback. Just tear it apart. And you can even disavow it, say, I'm testing someone else's theory right now, so let's be vicious. <laughs> so you don't, you know, you don't have to be the one who, who feels the, the thing about it. And then, if it's a success, you might say, well, actually, it was my idea, you know. <laughs> about things. So that, that tip.psychology.org place is wonderful. It's not the best website in the world. You can see that it's a little aged. It's a little rough around the edges, but it's just, it's got so much great information. The next thing is that eventually we stop listening to instructors. Now, my main role right now is that I'm dealing with subject matter experts. Some of them are experienced university people. A lot of them are consultants. They're trainers. Most of them have years, if not decades, in front of a, a class. Um, many of them, um, I would say a good third of the people I've worked with, are working with right now, have never done a class before. And they're terrified. But the ones who have, have opinions about what works and what doesn't. And we do a little orientation at the beginning saying, we all hate Blackboard and we want you to hate it too. You know, so unless they're willing to hate Blackboard as much as we do, they don't get to work with us. But <laughs> does anyone here know of a rumor that there's at least one instructor or subject matter expert in your, in your university who's like annoying? Okay, two, two, okay. Now here's the, again, the Dr. Phil question. How many of us in the room, particularly those of us who teach, think that maybe once or twice we've been the annoying instructor? 
Yeah, okay. So what I have found is, is that the annoying people tell me truths that the people I like never will. They'll tell me things that it's like your best friend won't tell you. So they're the ones you have to take off for coffee or tea, take a breath and say, give it to me. Because one reason they're annoying is because people don't listen to them. They may not be very good communicators, so it's really easy to discount what they're saying, even though what they're saying is really important. So what do we do? Um, when my husband and I were first married, he realized that he had married a pushy broad from the south side of Chicago, and he had something to say that really helped me, which was, Pat, shut up. But he said it nice. He went to like really good Eastern school, so he said it like really nice. And so what I have learned is that the more difficult that person is, the more I'm going to learn about what I need to do as an instructional designer and producer. So if I know somebody's going to be difficult, I think that's the person I'm going to learn from, not the easy peasy ones as well. Dismissing student concerns. Unfortunately, and I've, I have, I'm not a you know, tenured faculty. In fact, I have no credentials to do what I do for a living. But I have been an instructor at the undergraduate and graduate level at five very good universities and colleges. And I noticed that in many places, students are at the bottom of the food chain. They're dismissed, they're demeaned, um, and they do what we want them to do because they've paid a lot of money or their families paid a lot of money and they're desperate to get out as quickly as possible. So I take student concerns seriously, even if I can't address them. And by taking them seriously, you know, they appreciate that we're on their side and they'll give us the benefit of the doubt when things go wrong. It's not a warfare. I have to be on their side. And if I have a loyalty, it's to the students. I'll tell you that right off. That's where my loyalty lies. So again, invest, hush, ponder, and share. And sharing, um, one of the things I like about this conference is sharing is a subject that has come up before of giving, you know, we do too much of our stuff in secret. So I want to empower the people who work with me and for me as much as, power, as, as possible. Those of you in the room who have master's degree and PhDs, I think your first duty is to be teachers and give it away. Give it away, you know? So find all sorts of opportunities to say, here's the cool stuff I know, you get to learn it too. And the more we empower them, I think the uh, more we understand them. And it's not an age thing. In our little office, the age range is from 25 to 72. And we're a meritocracy. If you know it, you teach it. So our 25-year-old teaches stuff, our 35-year-old teaches stuff, our 52-year-old teaches stuff, the 62-year-old teaches stuff, and the 72-year-old teaches stuff as well. We're all students. We're all learners. Um, you're forgetting what it was like your first time. You're forgetting what it was like. Oh, there's smirks here. Clean it up, guys. <laughs> I'm embarrassed for you. You're forgetting what it was like. Now, I, as I, rec I already told you, I know I can remember very clearly what it was like with my first big serious platform, with the Jones platform, how I totally screwed it up. So my subject matter experts know that we will go the extra mile to help them because we know what it's like to feel lost. I've had people break down and cry. They said, I'm a smart person. I've been doing this work for 30 years. How come this is so hard? I said, it is hard. I don't, I don't tell them it's easy. I say, this is really, really hard. And once you get it, it's going to be a great skill to have. So we hold hands on this stuff, which I think is very important. Don't demean the smart cookies who don't know how to do it. So we listen, 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 watch. Not refreshing your knowledge in the field. And even if you're teaching something like analytical geometry, which doesn't like change from year to year, nonetheless, there's new ideas, new presentation skills about stuff. So going back to the new literature, even if it sounds the same, you may get a new way to present it. That's the stuff that I know pretty good. That's why I go back and read new stuff. Not that I'm going to learn something new, but I'm going to learn a new turn of a phrase, a new model, a new metaphor, something that's going to freshen the work that I do um, so that it's new and fresh as well. So I have to get rid of my hubris. I couldn't think of a good, that's like hubris isn't a verb, I know that. But I just had to think, we have to get rid of that kind of smugness and say, I can learn stuff new. I can learn stuff new. Never taking classes online. 
is one of the big ones too. And then the one that really disappoints me is hiding behind technology. It breaks my heart. We just had someone come to our office and ask for um, information about a project and we exchanged ideas and I said, are you an educator? And he immediately started talking about technology. It's really about people, folks, trust me. Even, and I'm, I'm a geek, I love the tools as well. So we have to stop hiding out. Here's the outcomes again. Here's a little wonderful thing. The universe is full of magical things, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. And no, it wasn't Bertrand Russell who said that. Thank you. There's the source. So here's my connections. I want to thank you. We've got our five minutes. I'm, I'm saying we have our five minutes. I'm looking back, and I thank you for nodding. Thank you very much. And what I'm interested in, um, to see if anyone has any comments, maybe you have a trick that has worked for you to refresh your skills, or you have a question about what we did. It's fun to take a day's worth of stuff and put it in 25 minutes. Does anyone have a comment about what we've gone through? I don't think, yes, sir. I would say that Uh, can you say more about that? Uh, like, like I teach, I'm a math teacher, and so they'll come to me with problems, and I'll say, okay, let's look at it. Let's see if there's a different way of doing it. And if I was show them, well, just do this. Okay, is that all you have to do? I'd say, yeah. But it doesn't work. Okay, don't worry about what's in the lesson. This will work. Oh, my goodness. You mean you go outside of what's online to teach them? Yeah. Is that allowed? I thought there was, like, federal legislation preventing, you know. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the, um, I have, oh, I can see that. I can see that. Anyone else? This is wonderful. You know, let's, let's align with the students about things. And I think no matter how well we do our courses, we cannot anticipate everything that's going to happen, right? Right. Anyone else have a comment? Something that you do that you say, yeah, this is how I refresh myself. You can lie. You know, nobody's going to know. Yes, sir. Um, I work as a faculty developer, and, and a lot of people that I wish were in this room, but they would never attend this seminar mm -hmm. because they'd look at the title and say, that's not me. Right. Um, I'm just curious as to how you communicate these ideas to people with a tremendous amount of hubris who have been in their field, they're multi-published, they've brought in 12 million in grants and, and done all these things, and who are you, you know, all 35 years old, to tell me? Uh, how and I thought you were 25 I, 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 to do that. Well, there's three things I suggest. First thing is that when you're doing behavior change, you have to recruit champions within the institution. So I remember a medical school that I was working with, and it was like the senior emeritus of the medical school was a total sweetheart, very well respected, loved new ideas. And when people saw that the bull goose of the medical school was adopting them, it was much easier to use him to leverage the other people. So you build that kind of champion thing about stuff. Another thing which you can do is to be really annoying about how much fun you're having. You know, it's like, oh, we're having fun. We're going to have cookies and brownies, and we're going to work on this. Oh, we'd love for you to come, Fred. It's going to be, oh, we understand. It's probably a waste of your time. Well, we're going to have fun by, you know, to put their toe in. And the third thing is that no matter how stodgy they are, there's probably something they're doing right that's in this context. So if we can con them into doing a little brown bag or mini thing on this is that thing you do so well, and they get to sit there for that, like, five-minute round robin and hear the other people. Um, that's a way of honoring them for their successes and then very sneakily getting them to say, I'm part of this new group who's doing, doing best stuff. It's a short distance from being avant-garde to the old guard. And a lot of old guard people, to tell you the truth, they're a little scared, aren't they? They're a little afraid they're going to be left behind. So let's honor them for the good stuff they do. Good question. Okay. We have one minute. Anything else? Anything else? Oh, now the hands, right? What we'll do is I'll grab one question, because we have to flee, and then I'll go outside and chat with whoever wants. And let's grab someone over here. This lady, go ahead. Um, I've... 
I work a lot with health institutions and most recently I had um, working with some medical schools and hospitals around the country. I would say a fourth of the people in the class themselves were instructional designers who had never taken an online class since college. And, and as one of them said, oh, this is so tedious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much. Thank you.